Are you back in that room? What the fuck was that? Are you one of the kids? Killed eight people with an axe, brutally. Like, with the blunt part, like, yeah. head's gone. I don't think we'll ever get responses this clear and this intelligent for a long time. Good call. Oh, if you've never been to the Velisca Axe House, there is no amount of experience on this earth. There are no amount of houses or buildings or haunted locations that you can go to that will prepare you for what you are about to experience when you walk in that house. On the quiet summer evening of June 9th, 1912, a family of four and two overnight guests were on their way home from attending church service in a small and quiet town known as Villisca, Iowa. Mr. Josiah Moore and Miss Sarah Moore walked their four children, Herman, Catherine, Boyd, and Paul Moore, with Ina May and Lena Stillinger along a quiet dirt road to head home and prepare dinner for the night. Sadly, this would be the last time any of them would ever see each other again as this tragic night would unfold a series of events that would strike the hearts and minds of everyone across the nation. This is the sad and true story of the axe murders of Villisca. Church service was regularly attended in the Moore family. Sarah Moore ran the children's day program at their local Presbyterian church, alongside her husband, Josiah Moore. Lena and Ina were regular attendees and close friends with the Moore family children. On the night of June 9th, they had been invited to spend the night after service had ended. It was often routine that the Stillinger girls were guests at the Moors. When the Moors arrived home, Sarah began preparing their dinner. The children played while their meals were being made, and all seemed as peaceful and as normal as ever. However, someone had snuck into the Moors' home while they were gone, and sat silently and patiently in the attic of the home, contemplating the fate of the entire family in total darkness. When the Moore family finally lay their heads that night, Around the stroke of midnight, the killer snuck out of the attic, brandishing the family's fire axe that laid out by the shed. With an oil lantern turned as low as it could go and a sheet draped over it to further dim the light, the killer snuck into the parents' room with only enough light to navigate the darkness. Without hesitation, the killer flipped the axe to the blunt side and began bludgeoning the moors in their sleep. They struck both parents quickly, instantly killing them both so that they couldn't be faced with any opposition in completing what they set out to do. When the killer had murdered both parents, they crept into the adjacent room and one by one struck each child once in the head with the blunt end of the axe, killing them instantly. After these atrocities had been committed, the killer snuck downstairs and attacked the Stillinger girls, also striking them with the blunt end of the axe and killing them instantly. But it doesn't end there. It gets much worse. After the killer had already murdered the entire family, he proceeded back upstairs and began the process all over again, bludgeoning the entire family beyond recognition. It is believed he struck each family member in the face 20 to 30 times. When he finished, he sat down in the Moore family kitchen and ate a full meal, and then waited until first light before skipping town. Josiah was the only one struck with the blade end of the axe, and was butchered beyond recognition. The rest of the family had been attacked with the blunt end. Crime scene investigators believe that Lena was the only one awake when the killer attacked her. Her body was positioned vertical against the bed, opposite of her sister's horizontal position in bed, and axe wounds covered her arms as if she held them up in a defensive manner before her untimely demise. It is also believed that the killer assaulted her, or at least attempted to, before taking her life. We will be discussing more details of this shocking case in part two, including possible suspects and the overall outcome. But for now, let's get into the investigation. When I first came here, Darwin was saying, oh, the kids will roll ball to you. You know, they'll hug you. Something like upstairs rolling a ball for two hours. Nothing's happening. And so I go in the attic, and I start just kind of going off, not like doing the come at me ghost thing, but just like, dude, how could anyone kill six kids and then eat a meal? Like, yeah. 
And when that happened, there was footsteps in the hallway. And on the audio I had going, there's like a growling going on. So, and at that point, everybody would do the, tell me who did this EVP session, mm-hmm. trying to get the name of the killer. Everyone was given different names. And yeah. nobody knew who the names were. Detectives questioned people in this case for five years. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of, there weren't four suspects. In five years of gossip in a small town about a murder. Every thousands of suspects. Oh, yeah. All these names were people that lived in town. Like, as I went back through the old detective notes, I'm like, holy crap, that name's the guy who owned the shoe store. Mm-hmm. What? Unless you're like a super ballistic nerd. Like, yeah. who's going to know that? You know? Right. Um, so that's why I was like, something's just messing with people in here. I think it preys on people that are mentally stable or rooted in whatever faith you believe in for protection mm-hmm. and exploits that. Yeah, Kelly doing that, if he killed him. The guy in the 60s that lived here was sharpening his knife in the kitchen with a sharpening stone. He's sitting there doing that, all of a sudden he like, stabs a knife through his hand and snaps yeah. out of it. They moved their truck on. 2014, the guy shoved a knife through his chest in that room. I heard about that. Seen a pattern happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, he, um, he was a paranormal investigator, right? Yeah. Oh. And I've seen all this stuff about always oh, nuts, or he wanted to be on TV, or he did it to be famous. Nah. The guy who stabbed himself in the chest? Yeah. Who would do that to be famous? That's right. That's a bit extreme. You got to really. It's a commitment. You yeah. Know, like, your body would, like, it wouldn't let you do something like that. No, you'd have that stopping thing. Yeah. And I checked him in. I mean, he'd been here this second time. I was like, oh, back again. He's like, Andrew. Oh, so you knew him? Yeah. Oh, shit. It's like, couldn't get the house a piece of my mind. But he said he's on that bed and they were provoking. Saw a light come out of the closet. Woke up in the emergency room. Doesn't remember anything. He took the knife. It was a chest. Jesus. So the only reason I want to say anything is this place has a very Amityville mental manipulation. It even has the windows. Yeah, it even has the windows. Yeah. Kelly, the minister that confessed that a shadow gave him the weapon, told him to kill, felt like he was being led beyond his own control. Ronald DeFeo said a shadow gave him the weapon, told him to kill, felt like he's being led beyond his own control. Wow. Six people murdered, no one wakes up. Eight people murdered, no one wakes up. A lot of similarities. Yeah. This was actually Catherine's bedroom, but Ina and Lena were in it that night. Um, two in that bed. The bacon on the floor, the axe against the wall, mirrors covered. So was the reason ever figured out why he covered the mirrors? The detective back then said that it was superstition reasons because it was bad luck to see yourself naked in a house with dead bodies in it. And I'm like, that's happened so many times as superstitions grown from it. Like, right. It's very huh. not weirdly specific, yeah, you know? Just a little bit. We know now with profiling, Killers do that as almost a sign of remorse. I don't want to look at what they did. The bodies were covered too, and that goes along with that. However, person ate a meal afterwards. That's not remorse. Why he did that, or she, who knows? I have no idea. Why was there bacon just laying there? You know, just. You had to have the thought process to do something like that and then go sit down and have an entire meal. That. To me, just something doesn't right about that Total at all. Psychopath. Yeah. Like, not just a killer. Like, to kill eight people with an axe brutally, like, with the blunt part, like, yeah. heads gone and eat. Like, that is complete. And kids at that. Yeah, you don't mess with kids, period. You know, you walk into a room where someone had an argument, you feel that energy, it lingers. Oh, absolutely. And it, we know energy doesn't disappear. So like this had an atom bomb of negative energy dropped on it. I think that just soaked in every fiber of this place. But I also think it's like a mirror kind of, you know, I've seen people come in. Oh, the kids rolled a ball with one of them hugged me. It's so spiritual. Oh my God. Next night, the people are gone. Like 10, 11 PM. I have to mail half their gear back to them. One of the last guys. Um, EVPs are phenomenal in this place. Really? One of the last overnights got an EVP. He wouldn't tell me what it was. He said it's deeply personal to where he had to like leave and collect himself and come back. 
And then he played me the other EVP he got, and it's just a woman saying a woman's name. I'm like, doesn't ring a bell historically. I don't, I mm-hmm. don't know. He goes, no, man, this was my girlfriend in Texas 33 years ago. Her name. Doing that specific thing brought up all those old memories of his again. Uh, mirrors covered. This is one of the bigger axe marks left behind. And that was from the blade. So he's hitting him with a blunt end as he comes back like that. He's cutting in the ceiling in the back of the wall. And there's a big blood pool of blood where you're standing. Oh, that great. Wasn't <laughs> connected to this one. So they think he came out of the attic. Boom, boom. Walked over here, heard something, and just froze with the axe as the blood dripped off the axe. Went and got those kids. The two downstairs came back, got them again, again, back downstairs again, but who knows? So this is the attic where probably the guy was hiding. The floors and stuff are totally safe. There's nails through the ceiling, so don't impale yourself. Okay. I'm just gonna read that one. Boyd and Catherine were all found. The ceiling was just tore up with axe marks. At one point in here, it looked like they said it looked like he went like this in a celebrating frenzy. I have no idea what that even means. What the hell? Took off a bunch of wallpaper, and then that mark was underneath, which I can't say 100% on that one, but I mean, it sure looks like an X mark to me. Yeah. yeah. This is where it happened. I've always wondered about some of these in the floor, like that one and then right there. Oh yeah, see them. And this is the same positioning the beds were? Exactly. So how, how many people often stay the entire night? Uh, it's not many. I mean, I live right in Mary Peckham's house next door. And so I'll wake up at four or five or three to go to the bathroom or something. I look out just to see and they're usually always gone. <laughs> but then I've had a few, like noon, I come over to do day tours and there's cars still here. I mean, some do, some don't. Half, like a hundred year anniversary, I'm downstairs by myself about 10 p.m. And I text my buddy, I'm like, man, if you don't hear from me by 8 a.m., like, get my preacher down here. <laughs> like, I <I'm> freaked out. <laughs> Nothing. Not a thing happened. But then, other days, it's just on. I mean, I've, I've looked for patterns with birthdays, anniversaries, moon phases, storms, the eclipse. See nothing. I, I think it's just more of the people involved. Yeah. You know. Tuesday, I was sitting in the kitchen. Day tours ended. And I just sat down and was like, oh, okay, wait on the overnight here. Yeah? Somebody left their damn kid here. Are you kidding me? I run up here. Nothing. I'm sitting there. I'm like, no way. So I go out, it's like some kid had to walk by or something. I back up the surveillance videos. Nothing. Nothing. A couple of weeks ago. It's the last day tour. He's walking out of the back of the house and then I'm on the swing out there and he just like does a, a shot of the back of the house. And as he's walking to his car, he's kind of zooming in on the photo and he's like, oh, would you look at this? Oh, shit. Oh, wow. Right. Whoa. And that's just like a shot off of his phone. Whoa. Yeah. I I haven't seen too many convincing pictures like that. If that would have been sent to me, I would have, my first thought would be Photoshop. But I sat and watched him take the photo. I mean, he just walked out and he did that number. And as he's walked and he's like, and then he stopped. He's like, uh, but I mean... Usually, if it's Photoshop, it's pretty freaking easy. That's 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 clearly the face. Yeah, it's yeah. it's really consistent with the actual photo taken. Yeah, it's not like oh, it gives me chills. Out of place or the obvious ghost app, ghost app or anything. Yeah, that's creepy. Any any other questions about anything? Um, do we have access to the cellar? Yeah, we do yeah, for sure. I'm good. I'm just ready to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> awesome. See it for myself. Good, good luck. Did you hear something? Whoever's making that device go off, can you talk into one of the devices in our hand?
What is your name? Is it okay that we spend some time with you tonight? It's a little kid. Yeah. Are you back in that room? What the fuck was that? Are you back in that room? Are you back in that room? If that was you, could you do that again? Is it? I can't tell either. Was that you? Was that you? Was that you? Try to do it again. It was upstairs. Is there anyone here that doesn't want us here? Oh, wait, sorry, that's the wrong one. Going in there initially, you really don't feel anything. Um, it almost just feels like you're walking into an old house. We're getting the tour, you know, we weren't really hearing anything. We weren't really seeing anything. It wasn't like Edinburgh. When we got to Edinburgh within 10 minutes, Ethan gets touched, we're hearing voices, we're hearing taps. It was as soon as we got there, but in this case, it was almost sort of dormant, like it was feeling us out. By the time Johnny had left, we had still, we hadn't even started investigating until several hours after the fact that he had left. It was around 9.30 at night. Almost as soon as we actually began the investigation is when things started to pick up. It's like once they knew what we were there for, they, they started to give us activity. We are hearing voices. I mean, you can hear it in the video, it's a child. We still don't know if it was an animal or not, but I don't recall hearing any animals at all that entire night. We heard trains, we heard cars go by, but no dogs. So it just makes you think, was that one of the children in their room calling out to us, or was it just something outside? From this moment in the very beginning here, throughout this entire investigation is when things start to mess with us mentally. I'm usually the one that tries to go head first into locations and lead the way, but in this case, I was really hesitant. I didn't want to be in here. There was something about the house, the feeling that settled in once we got there by ourselves that just screamed, get out of there. Obviously, we're not gonna leave because we're there for one very specific reason, but I can tell you right now that I, I was very unsettled being in that house the entire time. And um, you'll start to notice it as the video goes on, how my mood and my attitude and everything begin to change as I stay in this house.
Would you be so kind as to light that up for me, please? None of these toys will hurt you. They're just here for you to play with so we know you're here. Do you want to talk to us? Initially, when we started doing the test downstairs, just to try to get some activity stirred up, get some kind of response, you, you can hear in the audio almost immediately, we're getting disembodied voices, we're getting EVPs and devices going off. Once we head upstairs, it seems like things just really started to take a turn for the worst. I don't know why my mood started to shift the way that it did, but when I sat down on the parents' bed and I started doing that spirit box session, each minute that went by, I could feel myself getting angrier and more irritated. And I don't know why. Maybe I just had a moment where I, I was thinking about those kids and thinking about my own nieces and nephews and young relatives in my life that I just couldn't imagine something like that happening to them. And it really upset me. And I started to get agitated at the fact that somebody could do this to an entire family, an innocent family. Hey. hey. Hello. Who are we speaking to? My name's Mike and this is Ethan. What's your name? I'm sorry, what was that? I didn't catch it. sat down and you had a meal afterwards. What kind of human being does that to someone? Are you a human being at all? for what you did? I just don't understand how somebody could do that to a whole family. I can't stop thinking about this. Do 
You can talk all the smack you want. So, I thought it was a little odd that 186 came through the spirit box. But it's a very specific set of numbers. The spirit box, again, I let everybody know this in every video. We play the spirit box backwards on the AM station. It's sweeping at half a second per sweep, meaning that no audible, legible noise should be coming through that at all. You shouldn't be able to understand anything that comes out of that box. That's the point of doing that. So for 186 to come through, I did a little bit of research. I was thinking of, you know, maybe addresses or something, something with numbers, with that sequence of numbers. And I started to think about police codes. So I looked up 186 as a police code. I didn't look for Iowa specifically, just in general, the police code 186. Say that it's a code for uh, a runaway suspect. Some other precincts will use that as a code for a murderer in the vicinity or in the area that a murder has just recently occurred and the killer is still in the area. So maybe that was the killer calling out and letting us know I'm still here. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I got away and I'll always be here. But you're not gonna scare me out of this house. Maybe it's messed up what you did. I gotta go outside for a minute, man. We had only been in there for maybe an hour. I would say a little, little over an hour at most. And I already had to go outside and get fresh air. It was so overwhelming. It was so intense the way that I felt about this whole situation that if I hadn't gone outside and got fresh air, I don't know what would have happened. So as you could hear there, those responses took a turn for the worse pretty quick. And it was coinciding with the mood. It was, it was all fitting, it was making sense. The house started to feel very terrible. And we didn't know if we were bringing that upon us by trying to talk to the killer, trying to talk to whatever negative entity is there. So we decided to try to talk to the family just themselves, the kids, the parents, to try to call them out and have them come forward if they are there. And um, you'll see that it goes even worse. It makes me mad to think about it, man. I got nieces and nephews and shit, you know? Mm -hmm. I got a little brother and sister the same age as me. It's very different. We're going back up? I guess so. What are you going to do to us if we sleep in this house tonight? What's that? So in other words, nothing. Right off. You find this amusing? Is this fun for you? Well, is it yes or it is? Calm down. 
Why do you want me to calm down? You weren't calm when you killed those eight people. It's worth the damage. It's worth the damage. It's worth the damage. Can you roll this ball or make this ball light up for me? Was the spear box? I don't know. I mean, it was loud. That sounded like another person upstairs. Mm -hmm. A voice. Mm -hmm. Who's that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I was behind me. I was behind me. I was up in that corner. Up in that corner. Up in that corner. Which is the attic, right? Yeah. No, the attic is up here. What the fuck is over there? Oh, that's the bedroom. I'm not entirely sure if that was the spirit box still running upstairs. We, we did leave that on just because we wanted to see if we could hear anything while we were downstairs or moving around. There's a mix there of EVPs, disembodied voices, and the spirit box itself. And it's so hard to differentiate between the three that we kind of just left it as it was. Is it the spirit box? Or is it an EVP? Is it camera malfunction? You have to decide that for yourself. Thank you. 